Peggy Brousseau, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? You did. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. I, I should have asked before we started, but uh, that's fine. There are two I, versions that are okay. <laughs> what's the other one? Well, it's the emphasis on the first syllable or the second. Ah. Simple. So whichever one you prefer, whichever one falls out of your mouth, that's okay. Okay, good. Now, now I'm going to second guess myself the whole time. But, uh, <laughs> so so you, you've written, you've just published a, a beautiful cookbook called The Contented Vegan. And the subtitle is Recipes and Philosophies from a Family Kitchen. So I'm curious about all the adjectives. <laughs> um, why contented? Well, uh, it, it's an arrival at a, at a way of living and a dietary way of living as well that it, I have found very, very peaceful and pleasing. It's like coming home to the right place for me. And I will say also for my family. And I think increasingly for more and more people, um, it feels like the right direction to be moving in and the right place to end up in terms of what, what you eat and, and how you live. Mm -hmm. now you mentioned you grew up uh, initially in Minnesota. Yes. Right? So I, I don't think of that as sort of a hotbed of veganism. Definitely not. No. <laughs> so when, when, what, what was your first um you know movement towards whatever i guess it was sort of some form of vegetarianism but just you know making dietary decisions based on something other than availability and taste yes it was i mean it's it's also a, a movement in the direction of autonomy isn't it where um when, when one starts thinking for oneself um you you can explode or push away things that don't actually fit you and that was a process that happened for me when I started traveling and eventually came to London and Britain. Um, when I, I was first here in this country, uh, very early on, I ran a small holding, which is a, like a baby farm it's a, or a large market garden. And uh, that had a big orchard and a big herb garden, which I planted and vegetable garden and I began to sell produce and basically create a, a, a living for myself. And one of the things that happened was I was delivered a sort of rescue cow. Someone came and said, would you just take this cow, this solitary cow and look after her for a couple of months? Now I'd never met an animal, I actually never met one. And uh, she was, <laughs> She was a big introduction. She was also pregnant and she was also milking. So I had to do a lot of learning very quickly. And one of the things that happened as a result of that was that I decided I didn't want to include animal husbandry in my way of life. And pretty much overnight, I became vegetarian. Um, and then from there, I, I really went through virtually every pre-vegan way of thinking and living for the next few years and, and eventually arrived at veganism. And I was very fortunate because when I met my husband, he was already vegetarian, so was I, and we became vegan together. And that was a very, very um, unifying and pleasing thing to do. So that's how I came to this place. And then over the years, I uh, became more relaxed with it um, having had to learn, first of all, all about nutrition and about how to fend off people who said I would die um, by next Friday sort of thing if I didn't have meat or dairy. And then, of course, once I started, we started having a family, once I became pregnant, um, that there was a great clamor of people saying this would fail and this was no good and this was irresponsible. And again, I had to, to, to learn a great deal. And I say I, with my husband, we learned a great deal and we raised a family and our sons are, they continue to be vegan, even though they're young adults now. Um, so we're very contented. Gotcha. I'm curious about the, the, the London scene, because in, in, in the States, people tend to come to veganism through some sort of either personal epiphany or activism. Um, 
but the, there, there's not a lot of philosophical underpinning, you know, it's sort of like yeah. you know, it's ethic in London. Um, like every, everything is like intellectualized, <laughs> it, huh. certain, like certain, like, you know, you've got, uh, you know, where I lived, we have, you know, the Anna Freud house and, and like every, like even food, like the, the, the vegetarian society in London was very sort of intellectual and, you know, intersectional with sort of Marxism and, yeah. and, and holistic health and UFOs, like it was all sort of mashed together. Yes. What, what your experience was of navigating when there were so many other agendas? Yes, well, uh, what the predominant feeling I had at that time from people who were active vegans or activist vegans was that they were angry. And I wasn't angry. Mm. I felt very, and still feel very, very fortunate. And I feel very peaceful. And it's that that I think we should, and I hesitate to use the word should ever, but I've just said it, <laughs> that we should make an effort to feel that lovely sense of uh, calm, especially when we're eating, especially when we're considering what to eat. And it just strikes me that, that with so much anger, out there, we have to uh, refute it. And um, so I, I have a lot to say about the vegan diet or the plant based diet. Um, but I am not an angry person. And I don't, uh, I don't encourage the sort of angry vegan stance in anyone. Hmm. You know, I, it's funny, because I got that from the book, I just took a few notes in preparation for our conversation. And one of them I have in front of me, it says, um, how hard you weren't trying to convince or proselytize. <laughs> like there was, it, it was almost like a palpable absence of like the kind of sort of angry or edgy fervor. It's just like, yeah. here, this is what I have. This is what I learned. This is important. It's beautiful. It was, it was, a, it was a very sort of calming spell that, that the, Thank you. the front matter of the book casts. Like, oh, this is fun. This is fun. This is nice. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there is so much pressure on us, don't you think, to make changes, um, to be up to date, to be um, sort of in the swing of things. And of course, we're all rather frightened of the future, whether it's through COVID or through the environmental disaster that's looming. Um, and that fear, just like anger, makes us freeze and we stop acting often. And I think that it's better to make it a welcome and to, to set an invitation to come as far as one can on any given day and given one's circumstances and allow oneself time to grow into a new idea or grow into a new way of eating. And once that is allowed, then we are collectively much more successful. We can sustain a change once we arrive there of our own volition and with that sort of encouragement and, and welcoming that I hope I've conveyed. Hmm. So I'm curious about any sort of inner work you've done over the years. I know you come from Minnesota, which puts you at an advantage in terms of being <laughs> genial, um, <laughs> but you talked about coming to London and there were so many angry vegetarians and vegans yeah. and being surrounded by people who seemed um, defensive just by the virtue of your choices, like telling you what to do. Was there a period in your life where you were sort of more embattled and you had to like figure like how, how do you not like lash out? What was it just temperamental or did you develop that? Uh, I think it's, I think that I have a tendency um, to put up a wall that I don't enter battle. I put up a shield and observe and calculate and take my time thinking things through by myself. Or when I say by myself, of course, I don't really mean that. I mean by, um, by reading or by research of various sorts or by talking to people who aren't trying to clobber me hmm. um, and to, to give myself time to get back into my own skin and, and think, okay, well, how do I really feel about this? And so embattlement to me, as I say, is a rare thing, 
it's, I think, counterproductive, but I am very strong willed. Hmm. And anyone who has tried to force me will, will back me up on that. <laughs> um, but I don't need to enter battle with them. Um, I just say, stop, that's my line. You can't cross it until I'm ready. And in, the, in behind that line, I was able to, to find my way and to learn a huge amount about this subject and about cooking and about nutrition, all the whole package. And I think earlier you mentioned about all these other influences that you felt in London, um, Marxism and so forth. Um, I think that the good, the good side of that is that when we think about any aspect of our life, but especially our diet, I think we do realize, we catch a glimpse of how everything fits together. Mm. And that's very liberating and exciting. And I really ran with that. I, I really have enjoyed and probably relied on that phenomenon over the years. Mm. Tell, tell me how you cook. Like what, what do you, you know, what do you center yourself? What do you think about? Are you just looking at the vegetables? Are you connecting with your old friend, the cow, the pregnant cow and with people in, um, climate sensitive areas? Like how do, how do you bring your best self into the food? Uh, thank you very much. That's a really nice question. Um, I use it, first of all, cooking as a, as a creative expression and a way of anchoring myself or grounding myself into a day. And predominantly I get up in the morning and look at what's there and cook early in the day because I'm uh, there's time to do it then. Um, I'm very creative at that time of day, and it's quiet. Um, I, I just look at what's available on that day and put it together. So for me, that's very exciting. Obviously, I have quite a range of spices and herbs and vegetables that, that keep well, like the onions and garlic and so forth. But each week, of course, as the seasons move on, there's a change in what fresh foods are available. And there's a, a change in how eager I am to use dried foods like beans and lentils as well. Um, so I just, if I can say I respond to the day and what's available to me, that's gotcha. how I go. And how do you help um, your, your readers? I know you have an Ask Peggy feature on your website and you um, have a newsletter. When, when you have readers who don't have the luxury of time when they're sort of scrambling um, you yeah. know you have this gorgeous cookbook with so many recipes a lot of people that i begin to help when they first want to get healthy are so overwhelmed yes like a cookbook would be the absolute wrong thing to give them how do you help people who are just beginning to transition or who know they want to do it but they don't have time or things are complicated well how do you, how do you simplify those first steps well I think that the first steps are different for each person. Um, I've tried to, to, I mean, I fully recognize the pressure of time. And remember, I've raised a family and there's nothing more high pressure <laughs> than trying to get everyone sorted. And, <laughs> you know, uh, so a lot of the recipes are very, very swift to make. And they, they make use of time in a quite an efficient way. Um, but as far as first steps are concerned, I would say just go for one small change each week. If you can manage each day, that's even better. But each week, promise yourself a plant-based meal every Saturday afternoon or make one change to your breakfast that makes it a plant-based meal. Um, and then to, to take on the the habit, if you like, of cooking and preparing meals as an adventure, as an excitement rather than a chore, because that's what it can be. You can discover very delicious, simple recipes for yourself um, just by giving yourself permission to make a mistake or to combine things that you have no idea how they're going to work out, um, because this belongs to each one of us. Our relationship with food and with living plants um, belongs to us. And 
it, 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 it's not an obvious relationship at the moment because there's so much packaged food out there. And we think it's quicker to do that, even though we have to wait in line to pay for it, even though we pay extra for it because of all the parceling and pack packaging. Uh, and I would say it's a matter of reclaiming a little bit more for yourself each week, if you can, to build a connection with your food. Mm, that's lovely. lovely. Do you still uh, have a garden or a farm? We, no, not a farm, not in central London. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, no, that, that, that's passed now, but we do have a very small allotment garden. I don't know if you recall that from your time in, in London, but they're pieces of land that are owned by the city and then they're divided into small parcels and people put up their name on a waiting list to rent them and then they can grow things on them. Mm. So what are you growing? mostly herbs at the moment. I love fresh herbs, um, but we're going to grow some pumpkins and there is an apple tree there. Um, there's some sorrel, that sort of things is there as well. So lovely. Yeah. Um, so what are, what are some of a couple of the recipes in the contented vegan that you are most proud of or, or most would like to share? Oh, Oh, that's tough. Come on. <laughs> Which of your children do you love the best? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, well, what, I'll tell you one of the things I'm really enjoying at the moment. I've got three recipes in the book that are based on tempeh, which is an Indonesian food made from beans, but mm. it's uh, fermented beans. So it's very rich in enzymes and that makes it easy to digest. And I was given a gift of the starter culture. Um, from a company here called Tempetation. And uh, I was given a gift of the, of the culture and I've been making tempeh myself, which is a really new, uh, new process for me. I'm really enjoying it. Ah, how, does, how does homemade tempeh compared to store-bought? Well, it, it's got this wonderful fresh quality. I won't, I won't say it's like a green scent, but it's, it's got this lovely uh, fresh air scent about it. And it tastes very, very, um, ooh, it tastes nutty, slightly nutty. I think that's it. So I've never made tempeh, but somehow in my head, I have a, a prejudice that like it would take like 17 years. <laughs> no, I think you might be thinking of soy sauce or miso. They can take some time. Okay. Tempeh how, long, take how long is tempeh? About 36 hours. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not that hard? No, it's very easy. You, you, the first time you think, oh, am I doing this correctly? Um, but it is just a simple process that you do a few minutes here and there over the course of the 36 hours. Um, you're not on call the whole time. Okay, because I've been adding tempeh more aggressively to my diet, replacing tofu more and more. Uh -huh. um, I think I read something about vitamin K2 is available yes. in tempeh. Yeah. Um, and also now I have an air fryer. I just chop it really thin and, and spritz on some stuff and make sort of tempeh bacon strips. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've made a TLT in the cookbook, just tempeh lettuce and tomato sandwich. Ah, uh -huh. yes, with a, yeah. see, uh, I'm on that page now. It's got a, yeah. you know, spreading the yellow mustard. It, yeah. It looks gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> so I noticed another recipe that it looked like a very normal recipe, except for one ingredient. It was sort of a, a broccoli stir fry, but then you threw in allspice. Where did that come from? Well, it's a very, uh, because I've got the onions in there as well. Is that the yeah, broccoli? broccoli sizzle? Yeah. And with the almonds as well, um, they can get lost. And I found that allspice um, hooks the, those flavors together. Um, you don't need very much at all, but the, the flavor of almond could disappear, but with the allspice, you find it. Hmm. And that's a, a, a process I love expl uh, exploring of how a spice or a herb can bring flavors together. Ah, how, do you, how do you you just like have Experiment. interviews and try it? Yep. But I think also if you have uh, a, good, a, re a good range of spices and herbs and you can hold the food you're dealing with in front of you and smell it and then also put some spice on your finger and smell them together and it will tell you if it's the right thing the right combination so that's another form of reclaiming 
Isn't yes. It? Like your 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 willingness to say, I know what I like, or I know how this food um, um, touches me, rather than having to rely on other people as expertise. That's right. Yes. Yes. It's a very, uh, I think, a very exciting process, but one that's also in itself is quite nurturing. Um, because it, it just brings you back into the loop, the whole loop of food growing and producing these wonderful colors and textures and aromas, and you become a part of it. Awesome. Well, thank you. The book is called The Contented Vegan by Peggy Brousseau. Maybe you should spell your last name for our audio listeners. Okay. It's B R U double S for sugar, E A U. Okay, great. And where can, where can folks find you online? Well, I'm PeggyBrusso.com, all one word. Okay, and I'll I'll put a link in the show notes to to that. You're okay. on you're on Facebook and Instagram as well. And mostly Instagram, yes. Yeah. Mostly Instagram. Yeah. Which is a good, it's a good match because you're. Do you take your own photos? I do now, but not for the book. The book. Okay. For those those yeah. So did you did the pho photographer come over and take those? They used a studio in in London, East London. Uh -huh. Were you um, cooking in the studio? Not not this time. I wasn't. That was that was difficult at that time. Mm. So you just brought things in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't get to watch them work. No, I didn't. It's a pity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would write a cookbook just to watch somebody photograph. Yes, yes. I know what you mean. It was just bad luck at that time. Just you know, timing and everything. Right. When when we aren't in the um, pandemic lockdown, do you teach um, like in person classes? I, I wouldn't say they're classes. I would say more like, um, like seminars or um, workshops, that would be a better word. Yeah. Okay. And what's what's the difference? What's the distinction? Um, that I wouldn't be up there demonstrating, I would be move, moving around rubbing shoulders and elbows with people as they are doing it, because I think it's a, such a tactile and, and uh, tactile act to, to cook. And then also you have to use all your senses. And sometimes people just need to have a hug so that they, are, they know that that's okay to do, that there's, mm -hmm. they don't have to follow precisely the method and the exact movements of another person. It has to be their own. Wow, that sounds great. I would, I would, I would love to attend one of those when right. the, the world makes that possible again. Yeah. Well, Peggy Brousseau, thank you so much for this lovely conversation. Thank you for this gorgeous cookbook for, for YouTubers. I'll hold it up. Ah, uh, nice. Thank you. you can see it. And I wish you all the best. It was lovely meeting you. Thank you. You too. You take care. Yeah. You too. Take care. Okay. Bye.